Good morning, and welcome to NeoConnect 2020. NeoConnect is Neocon's online series of resources, programming, and events held throughout the month of June. I'm Monica DeBartolo, Neocon's Director of Programming, and I want to thank you for joining us. Today's session is approved for one CEU credit for interior designers and one LU for architects. It is also being recorded so you can access it on demand. You can find more details in the middle of your screen. We begin our week with today's session, Neurodiversity and Workplace Inclusive Inclusivity. Our illustrious speakers will discuss how we can design space that can help accommodate individuals with neurosensitivities and special needs, such as ADHD. Rethinking workplace design will support a neuro device, diverse and inclusive workforce. Our speakers are from two offices of HOK. Kay Sargent is the director of HOK's global workplace practice in Washington, DC. She brings over 30 years of experience in the interiors industry. Her work has taken her to multiple continents where she has worked with Fortune 500 companies on their global real estate strategies and designed workplaces of the future. Kay specializes in helping companies to identify their unique organizational DNA and requirements, align their space with their business goals, develop the workplace of the future, and deliver it across their global portfolio. Pam Light is the regional leader of workplace and leads HOK design teams in the creation of office spaces that inspire employees and support the business goals of companies and organizations. As workplace lead, her responsibilities in the firm's Los Angeles studio include strategic planning, programming, space planning, and design. Please welcome Kay Sargent and Pam Light. Good morning, everyone. Uh, hopefully, uh, everyone's having a wonderful day. We actually, it was interesting, Pam and I were just talking about the notion that it kind of feels weird this time of year to be home because uh, usually at this time of year, we're at Neocon in Chicago. So um, we're excited to be here with you guys all today and still to be able to connect in some way. Um, and I, I think we just kind of wanted to really start out by saying that the world and our work has changed forever. That this little teeny virus has had a big impact on all of us. And so as we go forward, the way that we really design is going to be impacted by that. And I think the question is to what degree, because right now we're kind of still in the middle of all of this. But one of the things that's really fascinating to us is that everyone right now has a heightened sensitivity to their surroundings, whether it's touch or proximity, et cetera. And it really falls into a lot of the research that our team has been doing over the last few years about how do we take all the information that we've been learning from diving deeply into the world of the neurodivergence and how can we apply that to today's scenario and quite frankly there's a lot of crossover and there's a tremendous amount that is relevant that we can learn from all of that so we really want to kind of start by giving a high level overview of what neurodiversity means so uh, we're kind of living in a time where there's an increased awareness and uh, a lot more people are being diagnosed with neurodiversity. Now the question could be, are we more aware of it today or are there more cases? And it's probably a combination of both, but we are absolutely far more aware of the notion that there are a lot of people that have uh, ADHD, uh, dyslexia, they could be have Tourette's, they could be on the spectrum for autism and or Parkinson's. All of those things are neurodiverse conditions. And at the end of the day, I think the simple thing that we really kind of focus on is that people that are neurodiverse are wired differently. Uh, all of us, quite frankly, are wired, or wired differently, but people that are neurodiverse tend to spike really, really high or really, really low on the spectrum, where neurotypicals tend to kind of stay in that middle range. And so people that are neurodiverse also sometimes have some unique challenges. But the interesting thing is that one in eight people are considered to be neurodiverse. 
yet fewer than 50% of the people even know it. I want you just to think about that right now. In an office with 100 people, you probably have you know, 12 to 13 people that are officially neurodivergent, but a lot of them won't know it. Now, why is that? Well, for my generation, and I'm in my mid fifties, so in my generation, it wasn't really diagnosed. You were just kind of that hyper kid or the one that had all of that energy. And so a lot of adults don't even know that they are neurodiverse, but a lot of the younger generation do. There's a heightened awareness of this, and we've done a lot of things in the, element, uh, in the education realm to really address neurodiversity. So a few years ago, when we really started to dive into the subject, what we found was a plethora of information about how to deal with children who are neurodiverse, but then almost nothing that really addressed what happens when you're an adult. And it doesn't go away. In fact, for a lot of people, it actually becomes more complicated in their 30s and 40s. And what happens, I think, is that A, you either are, are, aren't aware that you have it, or you don't necessarily want that stigmatism following you into college and then into the workplace. And there still is some stigmatism associated with this. You know, most people don't want to get a job and say, and by the way, I'm neurodiverse, so I need all these special conditions. And where they think at this point in their life, they might be able to, to handle it a little bit better. But that stigmatism is starting to wear off. And people are becoming far more aware of what some of those challenges are that neurodivergence might be dealing with. So 85 to 90% of adults with ADHD don't even know they have it because they were never really officially diagnosed. And for adults that go untreated, that have ADHD, they lose an average of 22 days of productivity per year. That's a lot. And when you think about the fact that people that are have ADHD are 18 times more likely to be disciplined or to be labeled behavioral issues in the workplace and are 60% more likely to lose their jobs. Depression before COVID-19 was impacting 14.8 million Americans. And it's a much higher level and a percentage amongst neurodivergence. Now, after uh, COVID-19, recent studies are coming out that showing 70 to 80 percent of the U.S. adult population feels anxious or stressed or very, very uncomfortable. And depression doesn't mean that you're neurodiverse and or just because you're neurodiverse doesn't mean you're, you're depressed. But there is a tremendous percentage of people that are. There's kind of one of those comorbidity factors that people that tend to be neurodiverse tend to struggle more with depression and anxiety. Eight million American adults have ADHD alone. And 65% of those 1.2 million Americans on the diverse spectrum are above average intelligence. I want you to think about that. 65% of neurodivergence in the US are above average intelligence yet 85% of them remain underemployed or unemployed altogether. Now, let's talk about some of the advantages of those that are neurodiverse. So people that tend to be neurodivergent tend to have extreme brilliance. Einstein was a functionally literate. He couldn't tie his shoes, yet he solved the problem of relativity. There are tons of entrepreneurs that consider themselves and or are neurodivergent, and they consider that the thing that kind of enables them to think outside of that box. Remember, neurotypicals tend to function in a certain range, where neurodivergents tend to spike really high at some levels and maybe have some challenge in, this, in others. They often have a hyper-focus. And that hyper focus has really made them very attractive to companies like Microsoft or SAP and others that have targeted the neurodivergent population, specifically those with autism, to come on board because they feel like that hyper focus enables them to solve coding issues or some of the other challenges that they're dealing with far faster than their neurotypical coworkers. They often see the bigger picture. They can think outside the box. They stretch those boundaries. They see things and are willing to do things that people that are in that neurotypical safe range aren't willing to do. 
and they often thrive under pressure. So think about in our world, right? Uh, you know, these are individuals that often uh, either procrastinate or they, they, you know, they have challenges kind of focusing in. And so they're kind of always living in a world where there, there's pressure applied to them. But that can actually really come in handy. So I want you to think about the life of a facility manager. You, know, you don't have it on your calendar that the pipe is going to break on Thursday at two o'clock. You don't have it on your calendar that COVID is going to hit in February and everything is going to go. And so they're having uh, a, a group of people who thrive under pressure, who do not panic, who can handle that because their whole life has been like that, actually can become the superpower. And I think a lot of people that are neurodivergent really do consider it their superpower. It enables them to think outside those boxes, to free them up and to do things that rational people may not be willing to do and really allows them to thrive. But one of our favorite quotes is from one of the autistic students that we talked to and they said that we are freshwater fish in salt water. If you put us in fresh water, we will function just fine. But if you put us in salt water, we will struggle to survive. We are designing saltwater environments and freshwater fish can't thrive in them. And so we need to think about, can we create spaces that are more welcoming to all? Because not only is there a compelling human and business need that can be made to create places that address mindfulness, health, safety, well-being and inclusivity, we believe at our core that it is the right thing to do. As designers, if we say that the environments that we create can positively impact the people that are in them, then we also have to acknowledge that they can negatively impact the people that are in them if we are not designing with intent and purpose, if we are not truly understanding the needs of all of those people, then we can be creating spaces that don't achieve what we need to. And by the way, if that's not compelling enough for you, it's also the law because the Americans with Disability Act and the UK Equality Act both consider neurodiversity a disability. And therefore we are required to accommodate them. And there is a day of reckoning coming. And that day of reckoning is when there's a knock on the door to HR or to corporate real estate where someone comes in and says, I'm ADHD or I'm uh, on the spectrum or I'm dyslexic and I need special accommodations. We're going to be put in a situation where we need to provide that because we now have a generation that has grown up well aware of their conditions and the types of things that can be done to help position them for success. And we need to prepare for that in the workplace as well. And again, it's not just people that are coming. One in eight people today that are already in your workplace are neurodivergent. You just probably don't know it. So let's talk a little bit more about the needs and how we start to do that. So again, we have that neurotypical spectrum, those, those individuals that are in the middle. And then on one side, you have people that tend to be hypersensitive, okay? They have, they have a difficult time with overstimulation. Uh, too much distraction, whether it's noise, whether it's sound, whether it's visual. Uh, they prefer to have some control over their environments and to eliminate or control that stimulation that they're getting. Now, the other end of that spectrum, we have hyposensitive. I don't know if any of you have ever seen the movie The Accountant with Ben Affleck. Mm -hmm. He was hyposensitive. He needed that extra stimulation. And if you've ever been on a playground, uh, for an elementary school around two o'clock in the afternoon with a bunch of little boys that have been asked to sit still all day. That's a pretty good example of people that just need to get that energy out. And quite frankly, we all have a little bit of each of these in us, right? All of us have sensory intelligence and all of us have sensitivities to the different factors, whether it's sound or visuals or touch or smell or proximity. I will say that uh, Pam and I 
and about 40 other individuals from our firm just had a sensory awareness test that we took to identify our own sensitivities. And it was absolutely fascinating because most of us don't think about this. But for instance, for myself, it found that I needed more stimulation on multi-sensory. I liked things around me. And if you look at my house, you would understand that. But I also want order and I can't have too many visual distractions. And some people found that they were very sensitive to sound, while other people needed more sound and they needed music. So understanding our, each of our sensory uh, intelligence and uh, how we respond to stimulation is really, really critical. But for people that are neurodivergent, spiking very high and very low, it can be the difference of whether they can thrive in an environment or they will struggle. And so when we start thinking about the spectrum of the hypo sensitive and the hyper sensitive, and we start looking at all of those different stimulations that are coming to us, really in a sense what it comes down to is that we need to create an ecosystem of spaces where individuals can kind of find their, the right level of stimulation that will allow them to settle and to focus and to concentrate throughout the entire space. And whether it's at their house, whether it's in their office, in the environment, we need to create these types of ecosystems. So hypersensitive, people that are overstimulated, it doesn't mean that it needs to be boring. It doesn't mean that it can't be integrate. It just means that there needs to be some order to it. Uh, there needs to be, it needs to be void of chaos, right? So in this scenario, you'll see on the left where there's, um, there's, you know, uh, rectangular uh, and curvilinear forms. It's uplifting, it's crisp, it's white. There's still some punches of color. There's some natural materials, all of those things, but there's an order and a calmness to that space. Now to the left is one of those happy accidents I think we sometimes make as designers. We were working for a client of ours and one of the things that uh, they, you know, we had wanted to have a panel between the two spaces, but we wanted to have some perforation through it. So we took the first, uh, the first code that they had ever written and we had it etched on this panel. And what was absolutely fascinating about this was that individuals would often go and just stare at that and get lost in that and the simplicity and the order of that. And they found it very refreshing. So it's important that we create those types of spaces. But it's equally as important that we're creating spaces where people can get out that excess energy, that people that are understimulated have areas that they can go to. Now, one of the challenges today is that a lot of spaces are designed and they're so grossly overstimulating that you can never get away with it or away from it. And so we need to create areas that people can go to that have, you know, they can interact, they can get that energy out of their body, they can get that stimulation, but we don't want to short circuit them at the same time. So when we start thinking about this, okay, how do we create workplaces that can really address this? Well, first we need to think about what is that ecosystem of spaces and what are we doing? And we really focused on the six primary areas that we believe are essential in workplaces today. So it's really this combination of um, concentrative focused individual work, that kind of communal processing work, those things that we might be doing, you know, we're working on the drawing or somebody's processing papers and we don't need to be isolated, but we also don't want to be in, you know, social spaces. So it's kind of that communal alone together space that we're in. Then we have areas that we need to create, areas for congregating and meeting and learning, areas for contemplation, which in a lot of spaces today is totally lacking, and areas for socialization. So those are kind of the six modality work that we really start to focus on. And then we start thinking about how do we start to address that from a hyper and a hypo sensitivity level. So I want to take the one on the left, the hypersensitive and hyposensitive for concentrative work. So this is one that I think we probably do a pretty good job on, uh, maybe by accident, but we do. Many places have uh, these phone booths or areas that people can pop into to have that level of concentration. However, 
for a lot of people, they don't want those to be boring and dull and drab, so they put bright colors and bright patterns in those. So I want you to think about it. If you're someone who needs to control that stimulation, and you've now just been locked in a small box with bright colors and crazy patterns, we literally have just short-circuited you. Okay, it's actually counterintuitive to what we need to be doing. Now, on the opposite end of the spectrum, if you're hyposensitive, okay, you just, you have all this energy in yourself, and we put you in a box, you, that, you can't function in those spaces. And so what we need to do is create areas where they can fidget, they can move, they can have a little bit of shielding and isolation and don't feel totally exposed, but yet they're just not so confined and they can move and interact with spaces. Now on the opposite end of the spectrum, we have social areas. And I want you to think about a bar. Okay. In a bar, there are high top tables right in the middle where if you're feeling very social, you might be going and you might be standing and you're basically inviting people to come exchange and, and interact with you. But if you're sitting at a table that's lower off to the side, you might be saying, I, I wanna be here, but I want a little bit of space. And if you're sitting in a booth in the back, then you're really saying that you need more space. And so it's about permission signaling and creating tiers within spaces so that people can choose their level of stimulation and their level of interaction. And this really applies across all six of those modalities of work. So I wanna do is take you into kind of this ecosystem. And even for small spaces, we can create this ecosystem of spaces. And I want you to think about it like, when we started to design for physical disabilities and ADA, we didn't necessarily, we don't wanna, what we've learned over time is we don't wanna call out areas. What we want to do is integrate the solution so seamlessly that people aren't feeling like they're being labeled and or people that are neurotypical in the middle can't also benefit from those same types of spaces. So it's important that we kind of create this variety of options and that we design with intent and purpose. And we start thinking about the different types of settings that we can create to enable hypo and hyper individuals to really find what they need. So let's dive into this a little bit more. If we think about that first modality of work, concentrate and focus. Okay, so you can see that the blue is really for someone that might be hypersensitive. And that pink is really for someone that might be hyposensitive. And they're common attributes that people that want to focus might need. You know, they might want, um, you know, more regular shapes and patterns that are encouraged. The color blue has been attributed with getting to deeper levels of thought and contemplation with some whites, et cetera. And so there's a whole list of things that really help from a psychological standpoint uh, address how people can focus more. But on the other side, there's differences between the hyper and the hyposensitive. So you can see at the bottom, someone who is hypersensitive might want a little bit more shielding, a little bit more control. Uh, they might want to be a little bit more isolated or off the beaten path, maybe have some enclosure, semi-enclosure or total enclosure, and those colors and those regular patterns and shapes. Where at the top, someone who is type O sensitive may not want to be boxed in. They might want a little bit more punch of color, or they might want more seating options or areas where they can stand and move and fidget, etc. So we really break down to what are the attributes and what are the principles and the elements of design that we can apply to really help individuals be successful. And we really kind of take this through each one of these modalities, so whether it's processing, whether it's creating, whether it's meeting, whether it's that refresh, and you can see the colors and some of the patterns and the materialities start to change to really kind of in, to respond to the types of behaviors that we need to, the, you know, whether it's isolated or connected, and even in those social spaces where you might have brighter areas or brighter colors and more patterns and things that are encouraging that interaction, but also there's a difference between the hypo and the hyper individuals. 
we can enable physical distancing that helps create great solutions without isolating individuals and designing spaces that bring us together. So I'm gonna turn it over to Pam because she's gonna take you through some of the examples of how we can do that. So Pam, over to you. Um, appreciate all the comments from people. Um, it's nice to hear the chat going on in the background. Um, this is a space that we did for Caltech and one of the reasons we wanted to show it to you because we really took a look at hypo and hypersensitivities um, as a lot of these people are on the spectrum. They're mathematicians and scientists. Um, they are those really smart people that sometimes need really quiet spaces to be thoughtful. The other thing we learned in working with them um, is, for example, on the left, the writing surface, that's actually resurfaced slate. And they, they write their technical information. I won't even call what they call the name because it would, I would screw it up too badly. But they use chalk on the surface because that texture in writing connects better to the brain as they're thinking things out. So they've really taken a look at who their people are, what they need to be successful, and they've started crafting space around it. The ceilings were seven foot six, and we know that if it's in a low ceiling, people don't think broader thoughts that they could, so we took the ceilings out. So we've got a full 10 foot all the way up to structure, but we dropped a texture in because we know as designers, intimacy is important in bringing people's comfort in a space to be together. So a lot of the tools that we as designers have used for a long time for environmental psychology are very important in making sure we look at spaces for the hyper and the hyper hyposensitive, including color theory, as you can see here. Deeper colors are more um, settling to people. In this case, they're a little brighter and they're lit, but they're in minimal amounts. Um, and then this particular area starts showing some social distancing, which as we all know, we're starting to look at how spaces can support that the way they were designed and then they will, where they will be designed until we get a vaccine. Um, this is one that, that Kay showed. It is a science and technology group in Silicon Valley. The public spaces where people mix are brighter colors, again, for attraction, for those people that are hypo and need more stimulation, for those that are hyper, they can go up and down the stairs, which is good for wellness. We've incorporated wellness and lead throughout this space, but they can still feel that they're part of the group, again, with social distancing. We can set up the tables further apart. We can take out a few chairs around the table. The important thing that we believe with where we are now is that you don't have to wholesale make changes to your space. They just have to be thoughtful in the way you put them together. Um, one of my favorites, this is, um, a space in downtown LA and it's what they wanted was a calm area. So we talked to them about adding blue and daylight and plants and softer colors, more neutral woods. So that as people approach this area, they start taking a deep breath, which we know happens when people start becoming calm in the space. Um, so now people have actually called this the refuge. Um, it's in the point of the building, so it's architecturally a really nice way to use kind of that funny point of space. But it's become a really interesting area where people go just to softly read or chat. Um, where that's an oasis for people to get away and be thoughtful, we need to make sure, as Kay was talking, that we don't negate those people that have too much energy, that need to be moving, that need, it needs to be in a socially acceptable way instead of doing jumping jacks in the middle of your floor, to actually participate in a game room or a fitness center where some of that excess energy can be worn off so that you can be more thoughtful and calm when you move to a meeting or go back to your workspace. Love the thing on fidgeting while you're learning. So this one to your left is not only COVID friendly, but it also gives you nice big swivel chairs. So those people that are, have you ever seen them when you're sitting in a meeting, they're tapping their foot or jumping up and down to a music that's not there because they're fidgeting in the uh, in the learning space. This gives them an opportunity to move, not feel 
um, isolated and not feel like they're too rigid in a space, it allows their mind to be thinking of other things such as learning. And then the one to the right, we start using more of our designed vocabulary, biophilia, natural daylight coming in where we open the structure of the ceiling above, natural lighting, the views are to natural woods, and the view on the other side that you can't see is outside. So it's a refresh area using those tools that we already have in design, but thinking of them and how they support hyper and hypo um, staff. Um, so in designing in a time of heightened sensitivity and making people feel safe, which is the big conversation we're having now with people, we there is the ability to support people and how they think within a space. But now with COVID, we know people are more sensitive. And one of the sensitivities is I need to feel safe when I'm in the space. So the next slide is one of the ones I think really speaks to that, where you look at this beautiful wide open space. So in the Savannah effect, if you can see broad areas, we feel more comfortable. When we used to come out of forests into flat areas, the ability to see if um, danger was coming was really important to us and again, a sense of safety. There's a strong element here. You see stairs going upstairs, which of course support health, but more importantly, support intuitive wayfinding. You're not confused how you get upstairs. You're also not confused where the interesting points are, whether it's the milk jugs hanging over the table in the center. This is Dairy Farmers of America. So the branding element is supported through the space, again, making people feel connected to the company. And then to the left, my favorite, favorite area, the milk bar, they actually make chocolate chip cookies here every day. So in thinking of the full sensory experience, when you walk into this area, you smell chocolate chip cookies, they have cold milk, you can see what's going on, you can see setting next to your friends, you can see how far away you need to set, and then to the left, which you can't, or to the right, which you can't see here, is an opening for, for exterior, indoor, outdoor spaces. So a very um, supportive elements for both hyper and hypo people. So Pam, I want to I just pause for a minute here, and I want, I want to uh, pick up on something. You know, you and I over the last several months have had lots of conversations about what COVID now means, and right. I guess I want everybody just to think about something for a minute. Okay, so you know, we're, we're already living in a time where we're burnt out and we're stressed, and tech is stressed, and just you know, the anxiety and depression and all of these things that we're all struggling. Pam and I are deeply concerned, and our teams are deeply concerned about going back to environments where there's red X's on work spots and chairs and tape everywhere and signage everywhere. And, and A, you know, everything that we do, we now have to rethink and we have to be very careful. And so the hardest things are the things that you take for granted and now you have to all of a sudden think about. So most of us are on autopilot when we get to our office or you get your cup of coffee and you, you know, your mind is going in a hundred different things. We just have to think about it. We now have to think about all of those things. And when we go into these workspaces, you know, if, if there are X's everywhere, um, it's stressful. And if there's tape everywhere and just even how we move through a space, we have to think about and what's been touched and what hasn't adds that le level of anxiety. And now there's signs all over the place. I, I think it it's a real challenge for us in the design community because we want to get to a point where not just from an aesthetic standpoint, I mean, and by the way, that does offend every one of my aesthetic sensitivities, but we want to create environments that don't just have like these red X's everywhere and hazard signs all over the place and just are constantly alerting people to the dangers or the hazards. And we want to get to a place too where we're creating environments where we can get back to intuitive wayfinding and we're going to go through a period where we have to retrain and re-educate people how to use spaces but ultimately what we need to be trying to strive for is creating spaces that are so well designed that 
we don't have to do those types of things and it's baked into the solution and that is a real challenge for us as designers going forward is to really have to focus on how do we get back to not just from an aesthetic standpoint but from a heightened sensitivity and an awareness and a stress standpoint environments that um would you know feel welcoming to people and are not just you know danger danger everywhere we look yeah okay why don't you take the next one i know it's one of your favorites yeah so it, you know I, I want you to think about just the sense of order too so you know getting to the office i mean and, and you know we've had many conversations about this adjusting the workspace is probably one of the easiest things we're going to have to deal with post covid getting to the office is going to be a real challenge for a lot of people and then the human factor and the human dynamics of us all coming together and so we need to realize that we're going to be going through stress and when we arrive at the building we almost have to have a vestibule we have to have this moment and we have to enable people to kind of de-stress and to kind of transition because what we're seeing in Asia and other parts of the world and in our offices there, there is a there is an arrival process that is happening. You know, minor if, if for some, major for some others, but we need to rethink that. And so creating senses of order. So in this case, when you arrive in the building, uh, there is that white corridor, high ceiling, very ordered lighting, no obstacles in your way. You can power right through if you need to and go on your day. But for someone who has just survived a hellacious commute and or needs to just kind of decompress, you can step off to the side. You can collect yourself. You can have a moment. The drop ceiling, the natural wood elements, the order, the little punches of color, everything about that, you know, just even the lighting changes, sets that space apart and allows you to kind of step over there and catch your breath or have a moment of refresh or a moment of respite and it's really important that we as designers start baking these things into environments so that they are welcoming so that they we can help de-stress people so that people can refresh and they can transition into the next part of their day so um and and this is a great example one of my favorites of how we could do that yeah, Kay, I saw one of the chats come up. There was a hypersensitive person that said all of the, the lights and wood were a little overwhelming to them. And, and I think that's an important piece. There are certainly tools and things that we know have been successful, but every person is an individual. And what works for 90% of a certain type may not work for another group. So we need to make sure our spaces are flexible enough and diverse enough that people on all levels have a space to go that they feel safe and comfortable in. This one um, is a reception area and, and it refers to, again, our biophilia, our natural materials, our natural color palette, the view, indoor, outdoor, um, and the ability to move spaciously through the space without feeling claustrophobic. You'll note one of our favorite new ads is the sink built into the reception area. So as Kay mentioned, the stress of coming in, whether you've been on public transportation or you just dropped your car off at the ballet and you've just come up the elevators and you're like, ick. So you can walk directly over and wash your hands in this space if that's what you would like to do before you move on to hopefully a barista that's there ready to give you a cup of coffee as you approach the area. So again, making people feel comfortable, safe, but not losing design. Those funny little plastic things that I've seen come across my desk on let's wash your hands look a little strange in spaces. Um, this is Convene, it's downtown Los Angeles. The, the piece here that's um, again referring to our holistic design that I think is important is this particular floor was designed to reflect the arts district in LA and we actually hired an artist who came in and literally poured paint down that wall. Uh, we have a little video of him putting it together. And the um, 
the energy that, that went into that wall then inspired the design team for these niches that are quiet contemplative areas to stop. If you're waiting for somebody to meet you, you can say, meet me at the main wall. You can talk about the brand. You can talk about the city, the view to the outside, the easy well staircase to be wayfinding, easy to find, as well as these short, small areas. So if you are concerned in larger spaces with high ceilings, you can come over here and sit down and be comfortable. So it's bringing all of the pieces that we already know together with a sensitivity to different types of people's needs. Yeah, and Pam, this is such a great alternative to X's on the floor, you know, little yes. tape. Yes. all over the place. Right. I mean, you know, I, I think we are going to go through a period of minimalism because, uh, you know, we, we had to break the news to even our, our own office that, you know, when you go back to the workplace, right. we're going to all have clean desk policies and a lot of this stuff. And and we're deeply concerned that we don't want to depersonalize and destylize the workplaces. Um, but any of the stuff that is out is all things that can be contaminated and need additional cleaning. And so I think we're going to go through this period of minimalism and where the architectural elements and the design elements become so much more important because those are the permanent things that cannot, you know, be, be taken out and can really help uh, create the types of environments that we really need for today. I agree, I agree. This one starts looking at fractal and biological patterns. This is um, a company that deals with cellular um, in research. And the pattern that you see is actually a blow up of a leaf. So it gives you privacy for your conference room. It refers back to the company brand, but just as importantly, it also refers to biophilia elements that make us feel comfortable and relating to um, an environment that we came from and we feel comfortable in, along with the natural wood and views to the outside. And in looking at this holistically, the, um, the metaphoric relationships with nature we've tried to, to speak to as we've gone through the space, making people feel comfortable with pattern, making people feel comfortable with patterns that they recognize, uh, making direct connections with nature, visual, auditory, a fountain is always lovely, especially if you're near a street with a lot of noise, it's very calming, olfactory, um, plants as well as the wonderful chocolate chip cookies um, are great in making a connection with nature and connection with your company. And then the pieces that we know within experiencing nature, whether walking through an open forest, inside, outside spaces, so people feel more connected. And then thermal airflow, which as we all know, is such an important piece right now with COVID, making sure that the airflow is correct enough that fresh air is coming in, but not blowing across the room to others. So all of those pieces that we all know are so important to now further um, expand on our knowledge and bring in our consultants such as MEP, lighting, and other experts that we have to really make a great space. And, and the last slide here that I'm gonna speak to, um, I think really pulls in a lot of those pieces that are such important to space. Miss Gay. Prospect and refuge. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. Yeah. So an open area, you can see for the savanna effect that you can see who's there. You have the biophilia for, for comfort. You are connected to people, but at a safe distance. It's prospect and refuge. Um, that we instinctively feel comfortable in, especially when supported with natural materials. And on the right, that is actually a cork brick. So not only does it give it natural and texture, but it helps with the acoustics of the space. Yeah, so Pam, I, I just want to talk about this, this concept a little bit because, um, you know, for people that have PS, uh, PTSD or anybody that's lived through any kind of trauma, they have a heightened sensitivity to their surroundings and it goes all the way back to our primal instinct uh, the very first thing that we seek, Mavlog's hierarchy of needs, is safety. And it goes back to, the, you know, animals on the Serengeti, you know, you want to make sure that you can survey your surroundings, nobody can sneak up on you, you have your exits, you know where you are, you're grounded, you're oriented, or you're, you're nestled in and you're somewhat protected. That, that 
those notions of prospect and refuge are really strong in certain people. But now that we've all have a heightened sensitivity and an awareness of how closely we are coming, it's really more important now, more so than ever, that we create these opportunities for prospect and refuge. You know, it's a wider corridor so you can control your path. You're not coming around blind corners and running into people. You can find areas that you can kind of nestle yourself into and kind of protect yourself. So these, these concepts, I think are really critical as we go forward to creating great spaces. So we believe that we can create spaces that help people feel safe when they return to work. And that each company really needs to make their own decision about when they're ready and prepared, but ultimately it's up to the individuals about when individuals really do feel ready. But as designers, there's a lot that we can do to help people understand the nuances. And there's a lot from our research around neurodiversity that can be included. So I want to pause on this page for a minute and just kind of share. Uh, these are the three documents that we have put out and there's uh, probably more. This will this has a little bit more than those three, but the first one really talks about and defines the issues around neurodiversity. The second one talks about um, how it's advancing. And as a spoiler alert, we say that, you know, it, we don't see this issue going away. It's something that we're, it's going to be around and we're, there's a heightened awareness to this. And the third piece that was published in Work Design Magazine really talks about the elements and the principles of design and how we apply those to really help people create uh, better solutions. So Pam, I wanna dive into the questions because we've got about 30 questions and some of them are the same, but some of, we got some great questions in here. So uh, the first question is, is there a term for, uh, for uh, like neurodivergent for those that are diagnosed with depression, anxiety, uh, bipolar disorder? The answer is yes. There's a variety of terms, and a lot of them have to do with the mental health world. Uh, some of them have to do with the neurodivergent world, but most people in either one of those realms typically have multiple conditions. It's very common, especially as you get older. Um, as you as People that have ADHD, when they get to their 30s or 40s, 60% of them also have other types of conditions as well. So it can be complex. I think the second question that we got is uh, narcolepsy. Is that considered a neurodiversity? And the answer is yes, it actually is considered a neurodiversity. Uh, but how you address that specifically might be a little bit different. But if you're in the workplace and you're narcoleptic, you clearly are going to need you know, areas that you might be able to go refresh or be able to take that quick nap or you know, uh, not you know, kind of create that. And so uh, we have a colleague of ours, Mara Baum, who uh, said, you know, says, has a great quote about all of this. When you design for the extreme, you benefit the need. And I think our entire team came to the realization that even though we might be neurotypical, we could all benefit from being in spaces that address these heightened sensitivities towards different types of stimulation. So Pam, another question that we're getting is a lot of people are asking about uh, the sensory tests that we alluded to. Oh, yeah. So I, I put in the chat, uh, if you go to sensoryintelligence.com, uh, Dr. Anne-Marie uh, Lombard coming out of South Africa. There is a uh, test, it's like a personality test. And it's, you know, you answer a series of questions It takes about 15 minutes and then you get a report. There's a charge, but it's, I think it's like $75, $80, something like that. But it will then come back and tell you, here are your sensitivities, here's what you might need to think about, here's some things that you can do or some adjustments. And Pam, I don't know about your experience, but I found it absolutely fascinating when I got my responses. And there were certain things that were like, that makes so much sense. I should have always yeah. known that, but sometimes. Yeah. 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 What I like too, Kay, is that even though you and I were in the neuro um, typical range, there was still a big range within that of, of different types of responses and comfort that we feel. So to Mara's point, if, when you design for the extreme, the mean has always helped. Yep. 
So there's, hey, there's also a question here about, okay, this, this is all great, but what if this doesn't align with our branding guidelines? So um, number one, I, I, that's very common. Most companies now have branding guidelines, et cetera. You know, and, and the other thing is you can't, if you create these extremes, you can end up with an environment that is so diverse and crazy that, it's, that it, there's no order to it. So what we would say is that you need to find the elements that you can. So whether it's for hyposensitives, you may not necessarily leverage all the colors, but you might use the principles like, for instance, don't make the quiet rooms really bright with crazy patterns. Okay, use your branding colors someplace else and be very strategic about where you can apply those and how you're doing that. Okay. Uh, okay, so some of the other questions, Pam, that we're getting. If you design for neurodiversity, will the diverse members understand intuitively what kind of education is required? So what we found is there was a tremendous amount of um, information about operational procedures. So what we've talked about today are design elements, but there are also operational procedures, which is training and awareness. Right. And then there's also, uh, in the first report, you're gonna find a lot of information about individual adjustments. And I think we would say that if you are armed with an understanding of what your sensory intelligence is and your hot buttons and your sensitivities, and you and we create an ecosystem, you will you will naturally migrate to spaces that you feel more comfortable with. But with that education and understanding, you can do so much more purposefully and even be more set up for success. Uh, Pam, I want to go back to the first example that you use, the you know, with the chalkboard. One of the questions is, you know. Uh, Audio, uh, audio learners versus visual learners, you know? So we all know in education that some people have to hear it, some people have to see it, some people have to write it. Right. So creating, you know, that space I think is a great example of, you know, for me, I have to write it, I have to see it. And so yeah. I'm often the person standing up in a meeting, writing on a board and taking notes so I can track everything. And right. so having that information sharing as we showed in some of those is really critical. You might want to talk quickly, Pam, about Caltech and some of the things that uh, you guys did there. Yeah, the um, Caltech was particularly interesting. First of all, the client um, gave us access to four of their, their leading people that we spent about a year with in conversations on design, um, and which was broadening to us and in, in the patterns that they fell in love with because the, the the patterns that they liked were mathematical patterns that, that repeated in their heads. So that was interesting. But one of the things that we worked on was the professors usually have students lined up outside their doors uh, because they're waiting for their turn to come in and see them. One of the things that they felt was missing was a way for those students to share with each other what was going on. Because typically they come up, they stand, they get bored, they leave, they sprawl on the floor. Um, and what we did is we did little alcoves on each floor in the corner so they can still see their professor's door. So they know when the last person has left that they can go ahead and move in. But it gave them the ability to have a little, a space a little more comfortable. We had banquet seating a little lower, so it felt more intimate. And they could actually start sharing pieces. What we found was sharing pieces from their term papers or their master's pieces, so that the whole group that was waiting for a professor started actually teaming better with each other and supporting their own learning. Great, thank you, Pam. Okay, I'm gonna do, we have a bunch of questions, so I'm gonna speed answer a bunch of these questions. Uh, one of them is about, is biophilia important to planning neurodiverse spaces? I'm gonna argue that I think biophilia and biomimicry is important in, for every space that we design. Very rarely, if ever in nature, do you see a square white box. 
Okay, and so biophilia is not just putting a plant in the space. Okay. It's about creating organic patterns, materialities. It can be the colors that we're using. It can be sounds. It can be a, a higher ceiling that alludes to kind of that open sky. It can be organic patterns and rhythms. It can be sounds that we're hearing, smells that we're hearing. There are so many ways that we should be introducing elements of nature and biophilia in the space. I think that is, as a profession, we've got a long way to go on that, and there's a ton of opportunity, and, I, and we are excited about creating spaces that are more uh, bio, you know, really have biomimicry that kind of mimic nature. Uh, there's a question about the does stigmatism affect a hyposensitive or hypersensitive uh, individual's willingness to open in the open plan? So I want to talk about this. Um, Open plan environments can, that give you options and choices and are zoned appropriately can be very conducive because if everybody has an assigned desk and you have no control, it can be very, very unsettling. But if you have options and choices, then you can. So if, if you are in an assigned seating scenario, it could be the kiss of death for somebody. If it's unassigned and there's really good choices and options, it can be incredibly empowering and that's what we would advise that that is the best way really to go. And also having areas that people can kind of retreat into. Um, there's a question about wayfinding and lighting. So lighting absolutely impacts, um, you know, most, uh, most spaces are very homogenous when it comes to lighting levels. There's not a lot of variety in lighting levels. There's not a lot of shadow. There's not a lot of you know, brighter or lighter or darker. And what lighting can also help with wayfinding because we tend to walk towards brighter spaces. But there are a lot of people that have a sensitivity to light. And so having darker spaces where they can control that is important. Uh, there are a lot of people that have sensitivity to sound. In fact, 10% of people get headaches from white noise in space. And so you're starting to see a whole lot of um, products that are coming onto the market now that have natural sounds as the white noise that tend to be much more palatable to individuals. Uh, Pam, we're getting a question about if it's already built. And you know we already get you know we already have this and it's you know there, there's a side seating. What can we do? Well, there's I think a lot of things you can do. You can start creating some support spaces, whether it's those quiet spaces or the areas that people can go and fidget and move and get active. In the first report, there's a whole series of recommendations that you can go through that. Um, really start to focus on what are some of those adjustments that you can make and even some of those small adjustments can really have a big impact on helping people feel comfortable in the space. Okay, that reminds me when we gave the talk to IFMA, we went around the room and talked to people on what they thought they could do right now when they went back and they went from, gee, I don't need that file room anymore. You know, we don't have files. We're gonna repaint with carpet and put in better lighting and have a meditation room to having empty corners that they, start, that they started talking about using color theory to make people feel either more inviting or quieter depending on what they were looking at on that floor. Yeah. Uh, there's a question, Pam, too, about introverts and extroverts and, and Myers-Briggs. Um, yeah. You know, Myers-Briggs tends to uh, focus on your personality, not your sensory stimulation. But, you know, uh, people that tend to be more gregarious and outgoing might be very different. And depending on if you're hypo sensitive, you might appear to be very outgoing, but you just need that stimulation. Right. Uh, so there, there might be some overlap, but it really is kind of focusing on, on different types of, of things that, you know, people are doing. Um, I want to go back to uh, one of the drawings, Pam, that we did. There's a lot of questions, I think, about, let me just get out of this for a minute. This whole and, and Kay, just quickly, somebody asked a question about how to find out more about environmental psychology. So Sally Augustine's book, A Place Advantage, is really a great primer and easy to read just as an overview. Yeah. So good question here. How do you start having these conversations with your clients? 
uh, and how do they know? So, you know, I'm going to tell you some of our clients who are incredibly enlightened and do an amazing job with diversity and inclusivity uh, totally ignore this. It's one of those things, it's the elephant in the room that not a lot of people really think about. And the second we start talking to them about neurodiversity, it's like the light bulb goes off. And I will say from a personal uh, standpoint, very rarely do we ever talk about this, and you'll see it in the chat, where people don't start self-identifying either themselves or some of their family members as being neurodiverse. This impacts all of us far deeper than I think most people realize. And so there's a willingness and an anxiousness to really address this. And so, uh, you know, I think the first thing that we really do in a conversation with our clients is to, to alert them to the situation and to start sharing some of the facts about, it's not a matter of if, it is that right now you have people that have needs that you are not addressing that you could. And so I think it's really, really important that we start having those conversations. Um, and also, we got Pam, we got a question about, you know, well certification and need, and et cetera. Environments that focus on environmental sustainability and human sustainability are really important. Um, and I think someone also brought up a question about, you know, we talk about the stairs a lot, but what about people that have physical disabilities? We are strong believers that spaces should be designed to be uh, encourage movement, whether that's between spaces, whether it's wider corridors, whether it's access to outdoor space, people need to move, uh, even just to get a, a fresh perspective, but we function much, much better when we can uh, really kind of move around in spaces and, be, and physically engage. And I think, Pam, we are at the top of the hour. I want to end um, on two things. Um, I went back and shared this uh, about the inclusivity. I want to end uh, just kind of reshare, you know, we have a whole bunch of information here about COVID that we have written about. So you can always go to hok.com workplace and see that. Um, and then I just wanted to share Pam and my, oh, you don't have it. It's our first name dot our last name at hok.com. We, we feel that the more people that are aware of this, the better we are. So there's been lots of people asking about students or clients, anything that we can do to help spread the word, reach out, we're happy to do that. Uh, you can go and read all the resources and sensory intelligence dot com is where you can get that test that we were talking about uh if you want to understand your sensory uh, yeah, awareness yeah, yeah it's a fun test and it's not too long so thank you guys very very much for joining us thank you everybody if you have any other questions we didn't get to don't hesitate to reach out and monica back over to you all Hey, and Pam, that was a wonderful presentation. You have inspired all of us, and I'm sure everybody is applauding you right now. Um, Pam, could you hold up that book again? Someone is asking about the name of that book. Place Advantage. So interesting. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you um, for uh, participating today. Please join us tomorrow for Ready to Recover, uh, Ready to Reoccupy, the Assessing Our Workplaces. Um, have a great day and be well. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care. Bye, everybody.